for joining this talk entitled Knee and Far Imaging the Remote Effects of Ischemic Stroke and Cerebrovascular Disease Burden. In this talk I'm going to introduce um, our two papers. One was published in Neuropsychologia called Lesion Mapping in Acute Stroke Aphasia and its Implications for Recovery and the other one was published in Brain a couple of years ago and that's the Anatomical Predictors of Aphasia Recovery. Now when it comes to mapping stroke in the brain, we are all familiar with um, these contrasts. So on the top left we have a classical CT brain um, contrast followed by several structural MRI um, sequences. That is a T1 weighted, a T2 weighted and a T2 flare image. And then on the bottom row we have the um, perfusion data for the very same patient and then three different types of diffusion weighted um, contrasts. Now what is evident from these different types of modalities is that they all identify the presence of a lesion indicated by the red arrows here but depending on the contrast the lesion appears slightly different. So the one in the frontal lobe, for example, is not visible on all the contrasts, um, but also the extent of the lesion into the white matter varies between the contrasts. Now I want to take you on a little uh, detour and play a reshuffling game that goes as follows. So the first reshuffle is simply by chronological order. The first image and contrast available to identify stroke is the CT scan in the 70s, followed by structural um, MRI scans in the 70s, 80s, and then the emergence of diffusion imaging in the mid 80s, followed by the T2 flare contrast, and then in the 90s, the perfusion contrast as well. Now, if you reshuffle those images, again, this time, based on their sensitivity to identify the onset of a stroke, an occlusion of a brain vessel, we see that now the diffusion and the perfusion images are leading because they can identify the presence of a stroke within seconds and minutes of the occlusion, whereby the MRI structure scans and the CT scan can even take up to um, days to identify the lesion. If we do another reshuffle, this time based on the anatomical information that the different modalities provide, we can see that in terms of the structure resolution, a T1 image is the preferred contrast because it has the most anatomical information that we can possibly get, followed by a T2 based um, MRI contrast and then we have the CT and the diffusion and perfusion images that are more blurry. In a final reshuffle, this time depending on how long it takes to acquire each modality, and here the MRI, the structural MRI sequences are leading and can be acquired within two to four minutes, depending on how much anatomical resolution is um, required. Then we have the CT scan, and then the perfusion and diffusion scan, especially with more advanced sequences, these tend to take longer. Now, what's the point that I'm trying to make here? The point is that ideally we want to have a little bit of everything. We want to have an imaging contrast that is specific and sensible to the onset of a stroke occlusion. We want to be able to clearly delineate a lesion so the anatomical resolution has to be high and ideally we want all of this to be able to happen with a fast acquisition time especially when imaging in a clinical setting. Now sadly there is no ideal contrast that can do it all for us at the moment but I want to introduce you to one new map that is based on diffusion data and for those of you who work with diffusion data, you're probably all familiar with the fractional anisotropy or FA maps. 
Now this new map that was made available by Flavio Delacroix from London is called the anisotropic power map and the advantage of this map is that it provides a lot more anatomical features compared to the FA map but all the information as encoded in the FA map is also available in the AP map. Another advantage that comes with this contrast is that you can see here it's quite comparable to a T1 image and when it comes to trying to register your diffusion data and your structural MRI data obviously if you have more information to co-register the, co the registration will be better. So this is a contrast you might want to investigate a little bit more. Now I said earlier that the stroke appears different on different contrasts but one thing that's important to notice is that also across time the presentation of a stroke can vary within a contrast and what you see here is the fluctuations in the T2 weighted, diffusion weighted and the ADC signal from the acute stage to 24 hours, 7 days and 30 days. And what you can appreciate is that depending on when the imaging data is acquired, the lesion appears very different on the signal and at times the scan can even appear completely normal before the um, lesion attenuates again. And that's why this phenomenon is referred to as pseudo-normalization. So coming back to our different contrasts available from clinical imaging, they are all great because they can show the presence of a lesion. However, they are all limited in terms of visualizing the individual white matter pathways. And the question is, why are we interested in visualizing individual tracts? Why do we need to know which particular tract is um, affected by lesion? Here are three answers that I provide for you. The first one is that we can use it to um, identify atypical cases using a disconnection mechanism or a remote disconnection. We can also um, map unnamed white matter and extend our localization of lesions into the white matter. And lastly, we can use um, white matter to identify inter-individual variability. Now let me give you examples for all of these um, points here. So the first one is to use the disconnection mechanism to explain atypical cases. What you see here is a brain tumour patient who had a tumour in the dorsal frontal cortex but presented clinically with a Broca's aphasia. Now looking at the T1 scan, this is considered a atypical patient, so a patient where the tumour is not in the cortical area that one would suspect given the clinical presentation. However, performing diffusion imaging on this particular patient, one can appreciate that even though the tumour itself is not impacting on Broca's area in the inferior frontal gyrus, the edema surrounding the tumour is incorporating the long segment and the anterior segment of the arcuate fasciculus and this might explain the presentation of the patient with production deficits. Now the second example is uh, to extend the localization of lesions into the unnamed white matter. Now what do I mean by that? We often read um, notes in clinical notes or in papers sometimes that just say um, insular lesion with extent to the white matter for example. Now, one thing to know is that depending on which white matter that lesion extends to, the clinical presentation of a patient will be very different. And to give you a quick orientation what you're looking at here, this is a corona slice through the brain. And the colours are probability maps of the white matter. And in red, you can see the mid-sagittal part of the corpus callosum, for example, and in blue-purple, you can see the cortical spinal tract 
and the green blobs are the arcuate fasciculus. Now, a localization of lesion, as I said, if there is a insular lesion that extends ventrally, it might impact on the optic radiation, for example. So you see that here with the dotted line going towards the temporal stem and the temporal lobe. Now, if that is the lesion, then the patient may present with hemianopia or visual agnosia. If, however, the insular lesion extends medially, it will impact the um, cortical spinal tract, the internal capsule, and that patient may now present with hemiparesis or somatosensory deficits instead. If that lesion extends dorsally towards the frontal lobe, then it might impact on the arcuate fasciculus and the patient presents with language deficits. So depending on where the lesion is located and which white matter is impacted, the clinical presentation will be vastly different. So the take home message here is that it's important to know your white matter when studying clinical cohorts. The second point I want to make here is that there is unnamed white matter in this image, um, indicated here by the red arrows, and there's a lot of areas in this particular brain that are not connected by white matter. Now, I'm not saying there is no white matter. What I'm showing you here is an atlas from 2012 that is based on diffusion tensor imaging, um, and that particular algorithm was not able to map the lateral projections of, for example, the corpus callosum. And this is a fact that we know as um, false negative reconstructions. Now, there is many updates of atlases nowadays that do map a more comprehensive anatomy of the white matter. Um, but the most comprehensive I've seen up until now is this one that's forthcoming, where the entire brain is uh, connected with white matter based on the spherical deconvolution. And also now is a good time to get on board if you ever want to have a tract in your name because there's a lot of connections that have not been labeled yet. So now is the time <laughs> to um, make your mark and your claim to fame. Now the last example that I wanted to give you is using uh, tractography to map into individual differences. So what you see here on the left is the arcuate fasciculus in the classical presentation and on the right you see the update from modern neurology where the arcuate fasciculus has been segmented into three different segments. In red you can see the long direct segment that is between Broca's territory in the inferior frontal gyrus and Wernicke's territory in the temporal lobe. Then in green, you can see the anterior indirect segment that is connecting Broca's territory to Geschwind's territory in the inferior parietal lobe. And then finally, the posterior indirect segment in yellow that is connecting the inferior parietal lobe to Wernicke's area. Now, if you look at the arcuate as a whole, there is no significant lateralization between the left and the right hemisphere. However, when you split the tract into its three segments, you can now appreciate that there is inter-individual differences in the healthy population. And that difference is signified by uh, the majority of us being strongly left lateralized where it's really hard to map an arcuate in the right hemisphere, and about 40% of us um, with varying degrees of the arcuate fasciculus in the right hemisphere. Now there has been shown to be a um, sex difference in the anatomy, whereby men tend to be in group one, and women tend to be more equally distributed across the three groups. Now when Looking at the a priori anatomy of the arcuate fasciculus and neurocognitive assessments, in this case the California Verbal Learning Test, those papers demonstrate that a more bilateral anatomy of the arcuate fasciculus seems to be 
better when it comes to performance on the California Verbal Learning Test and group three consistently outperformed the other two groups. So this indicates that a more bilateral representation might be advantageous. Now the question that came from this work really is what does this mean in a clinical setting? And is there a chance that if you have a lesion in the right, uh, sorry, in the left hemisphere, that you're more likely to recover if you have an arcuate in the right hemisphere? So this is exactly what we looked at in this next study, where we recruited patients who had a first ever stroke to the left hemisphere. And following the stroke, they developed language deficits, i.e. they became aphasic. And we invited those patients to um, come in and perform neuroimaging and neurocognitive assessments and come back after six months to repeat all of those assessments. Now what you see here on the right is the results from the study that are corrected for the um, age of the patients, their sex, other demographics and lesion size. And the x-axis shows you the size of the right lung segment. And on the y-axis, you see the aphasia severity AQ as measured with the Western aphasia battery six months after symptom onset. I highlighted three patients for you here. Patient one, you see at the bottom left as well, is a 59 year old male who has quite a thin connection in the right hemisphere and his recovery was not great after six months. The second patient did slightly better and you can see that her arcuate was stronger in the right hemisphere. And then finally patient three in the top right of the graph. This lady is above the blue dotted line and that is the line based on which the test assumes that the patient fully recovered um, language. So in fact, this lady was presenting with um, normal language after six months and had a really thick connection in the right hemisphere. So this study indicates that having a, a more bilateral a priori anatomy might indeed be advantageous when it comes to recovering language after a lesion to the left hemisphere. Now I want to just make one more point on this and that is um, the fact that not all tracts are asymmetric and that asymmetry can change across the lifespan. So it's always important to have a um, bi-hemispheric representation of the white matter. Know your tract in the other hemisphere as well, not just in the one side that you're interested in. But also it's important to be aware of how these white matter pathways can change across the lifespan. So the arcuate, for example, tends to be more bilateral in children and later on tends to be more left lateralized. This is a pattern that other tracts follow, but if you look at the untonate, for example, uh, not every tract is following that same trajectory. Now, this is particularly important when it comes to uh, the study of language in the brain and of utmost importance when it comes to uh, neurosurgical interventions and language performance afterwards. Now, with that, I invite you to Read the two publications where you find all of this information and more detail. Thank you.